We've previously considered how the flow behavior of submarine sediment gravity flows, especially turbidites, influences the resulting deposits on these small-scale point source fans. So keep in mind that this model here, like the one you looked at before, is just an idealized situation. So there can be some variability in where specific facies actually occur, depending on the type of sediment supplied or on the morphology of the fan. We'll come back to that later in this video. But to begin with, this video takes a, a bigger picture view of submarine fans to consider the vertical succession of facies as channels or lobes on the fan migrate laterally or, or proximally or, or distally along the fan. Sometimes a, a single facies type itself is not that distinctive of a particular environment, but the vertical succession of different facies can provide perhaps more clues to reconstruct the original fan environment. So there are two broad categories of, of depositional trends or facies successions in submarine fans or in, in many environments, to be, to be honest. Um, sediments can become finer upwards, which means that they gradually over time represent lower energy depositional processes with beds typically becoming thinner. So these are often called fining upwards successions, sometimes, sometimes called thinning upwards successions. Alternatively, there can be an upward shift over time to coarser sediment, higher energy processes, and thicker beds, uh, a coarsening upward succession. So these successions produce depositional cyclicity, cycles from coarse to fine and coarse to fine and coarse to fine again, for example. They may result from either these processes that are called autocyclic processes or from allocyclic processes. Autocyclic processes are ones that occur simply because of the behavior of the system itself, not because of external factors. For example, submarine fan channels and lobes migrate laterally regardless of external conditions. The same is true of meandering rivers from a few weeks ago. Meandering rivers just meander, that's what they do. On the other hand, allocyclic processes are external driving forces and are nearly exclusively caused by changes in base level, like sea level, tectonics, or climate. But before you invoke base level changes in allocyclic processes, you should always consider whether autocyclic processes can explain the observed succession. So in submarine fans, these fining upward successions could reflect abandonment of a channel and its gradual filling with finer grain sediments as the channel fills up. It could reflect lateral migration of a channel and lobe. Areas closer to the channel should have coarser grain flows, higher energy flows, and thicker beds and areas further away from the channel laterally, even if you have flow stripping in these overtopping beds, should still be finer grained and thinner bedded. Alternatively, this could just be sort of building up of the levee over time, which would lead to successive deposition of finer sediments as fewer and, and thinner flows were able to overtop the levee. These coarsening upward successions could result from, for example, progradation of the fan as the fan builds outwards away from its source, um, since the more proximal areas should be coarser grained or higher energy. Coarsening upward successions could also reflect lateral migration, in this case from the lateral margin towards the channel. So note that these successions, these fining upwards or coarsening upwards successions, refer to gradational shifts in the facies, these gradual shifts over time towards coarser or finer beds. And they are not the same thing, or these, what we don't call these abrupt changes fining or coarsening upwards. So an abrupt change, say from very fine to very coarse sediment without a gradual trend, um, would reflect some sort of abrupt process on the fan. For, for example, like the avulsion of a channel the channel breaking through and, and abruptly switching positions on the lobe. So, you know, allocyclic processes are typically very important in fan environments as well as other environments. But submarine fan sedimentation can also be affected by sea level changes somewhat indirectly. There's always accommodation space in the submarine fan. But when sea level is low, the sediment source, like the river mouth for example, is very close to the shelf edge, which means that it dumps lots of sediment directly into the fan. So therefore the fan should have more sediment, you know, will become coarser grain, may, may build outwards, prograde outwards. Uh, falling base level can also enhance the coarse sediment supply because, as you learned previously, 
negative accommodation in a fluvial setting leads to erosion of sediment, and so the river will be actively eroding sediment, not depositing it, and it will dump the sediment, this coarse sediment, directly into the fan. On the other hand, when sea level is high, sediment is entering the marine system at river mouths that are located very, very far from the shelf edge. So a lot of that sediment gets trapped in a beach set in beach settings or delta settings. Uh, very little of it will actually make its way all the way across to the shelf to make it into the submarine fan. In addition, the stability of the shelf edge, the Connell Shelf is a very flat area, and then the slope at the shelf edge is, is steeper. But the stability of this edge, where it's stable or whether it collapses or, or fails and gives you slumps, is affected by energy, particularly waves. So wave energy that hip, hits this steeper shelf edge can trigger slumps or slides of material uh, which build up the fan directly or which can transform into turbidity currents or, or debris flows. So when sea level is very high, wave energy hitting the shelf edge is, is low. So the shelf edge itself is stable. There's very little slumping of material. So what this means is that at high sea level, the fan might be quite inactive and, and may be characterized more by just gradual settling of this hemipelagic sediment. So coming back to this idea of typical fans, we've dealt before with these smaller sand-rich fans, and that's just because they've been the most heavily studied, and so their facies models are the best understood. But it's important to recognize that they're not representative of all fan deposits. In particular, the fan facies will differ depending on the grain size supplied to the fan, as well as with the organization of the source, whether it's a single point source, or whether there are multiple sources, or even sort of continuous lateral sources. So we'll consider a couple of these issues very briefly, at least, just to think about the bigger trends that you might expect. So if we think about a, a more gravel-rich system, where there is a lot of very coarse sediment being supplied to the, to the fan, deposition is really dominated by debris flows. That's just because turbulence often isn't powerful enough to support and move coarse-grained, very dense sediment flows you might find in gravel or, or pebble-cobble-rich environments. So because debris flows dominate, and due to their plastic rheology, these fans tend to be small and have high gradients. Plastic debris flows just can't flow long distances, and they can't flow over low gradient slopes because the shear stress is just not enough to overcome the yield strength. These fans are also unchannelized because debris flows are laminar and therefore not particularly erosive, and they have very poorly organized lobes because debris flows can't spread out because of their rheology, and so they form these localized blobs. In contrast, kind of at the other end of the spectrum, we have very mud-rich fans. And they are formed largely from turbidity currents, so because of that, they are extremely large, or can be extremely large. Um, they have very long and highly sinuous channels, and are composed of these laterally extensive, very thin beds that you expect because turbid turbidity currents um, have a Newtonian rheology, so they can flow long distances over flat slopes and they can spread out very thin. There's no yield strength to be overcome. These channels have very well-developed levees and are often more stable in their position. They tend to aggrade or build upwards more than they migrate laterally. And so because mud-rich sediments are also tend to be more cohesive, they stick together better, slumps which are these sort of coherent blocks, potentially containing soft sediment folding or deformation, can be more frequent on the slope environment than they would be in a sand-rich fan or a gravel-rich fan, where the sediment being less cohesive will just disintegrate into a debris flow. So don't worry about all the diagrams here, all the details. The main point here is just to consider how the nature of the source can affect the organization of the fan in particular. So the source can vary from a single point to multiple spaced points, and finally to something approximating a continuous uh, line of sediment, which in this case is called a linear slope apron. So along this gradient, source stability decreases. In a point source, sediment always comes from the same place. But in a slope apron, it can come from many places. It might come from one place here, and then a little bit later come from a different source, and, and the sources are shifting in time and space fairly, fairly irregularly. 
And so also as the number of sources increase, there becomes increasing overlap of, of the resulting lobes that they're depositing. And so therefore the facies in a vertical succession are tend to be less organized. You make a deposition from one lobe and then it's overlapped by a different lobe over time and so you have more, more irregular sedimentation. So we spend a lot of time discussing sediment gravity flows like turbidity currents or debris flows but they aren't the only way that sediment is transported in the deep ocean. Actually, many areas in the deep sea have fairly continuous unidirectional current flow. It can be up to a few tens of centimeters a second. And so at that speed, it's able to transport silt, maybe very fine sand, even fine sand. Examples of these currents include things like thermohaline currents, wind-driven currents, tidal currents, these things called internal waves. The origin of them is not really that important for our purposes, but it's just interesting to note that with a current velocity on the order of a few tens of centimeters per second and fine sand, it can produce current ripples. And actually, rippled surfaces are somewhat widespread in the deep sea. Uh, deep sea currents on the Connell slopes often flow parallel to the slope. They're sort of contour parallel because of the, the Coriolis force, primarily. And these contour parallel currents produce distinctive deposits called contourites. Kind of the equivalent of turbidity currents and turbidites, you have contour currents and contourites. Uh, because the flows are, are weak, you know, they're only a few tens, maybe 10 centimeters a second, 20, something on those lines, the grain size is usually mud or silt or perhaps very fine sand. And the most typical sedimentary structures you might find are these faint, discontinuous laminations formed by little strings of slightly coarser particles. Uh, ripples you know, may be present sometimes if the flow is a little bit more energetic, but you should be able to note, it, note them because their paleocurrent direction will be perpendicular to the direction measured in a more downslope flowing turbidite, for example. So this picture shows neoproterozoic contourite deposit above uh, from Newfoundland. Uh, the laminations here are these little sort of sand stringers in a, in a silty or muddy rock. Um, they tend to be quite clear here because this predates the evolution of a lot of animals. There's no burrowing animals. In younger rocks, these primary sedimentary structures like these laminations are obliterated by the burrowing activities of animals. So burrowing or bioturbation is quite intense in these contourites because the sedimentation rate is pretty slow. So that gives the animals more time to mix up sediments. So in the modern, contourites may be difficult to recognize just because they're so mixed by sediments. But if they do have sedimentary structures, this discontinuous silt or sand laminae or potentially ripples are pretty distinctive for contourites.